a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Blackbeard Edward Teach or Edward Thatch, better known as Blackbeard, was an English pirate who operated around the West Indies and the eastern coast of Britain's North American colonies. Little is known about his early life, but he may have been a sailor on privateer ships during Queen Anne's War before settling on the Bahamian island of New Providence, a base for Captain Benjamin Hornigold, whose crew Teach joined around 1716. Hornigold placed him in command of a sloop that he had captured, and the two engaged in numerous acts of piracy. Their numbers were boosted by the addition to their fleet of two more ships, one of which was commanded by Steed Bonnet. But Hornigold retired from piracy towards the end of 1717, taking two vessels with him. Teach captured a French merchant vessel, renamed her Queen Anne's Revenge, and equipped her with 40 guns. He became a renowned pirate. His nickname derived from his thick black beard and fearsome appearance. He was reported to have tied lit fuses under his hat to frighten his enemies. He formed an alliance of pirates and blockaded the port of Charlestown, South Carolina, ransoming the port's inhabitants. He then ran Queen Anne's revenge aground on a sandbar near Beaufort, North Carolina. He parted company with Bonnet and settled in Bath Town, where he accepted a royal pardon. But he was soon back at sea, where he attracted the attention of Alexander Spotswood, the governor of Virginia. Spotswood arranged for a party of soldiers and sailors to capture the pirate which they did on the 22nd of November 1718 following a ferocious battle. Teach and several of his crew were killed by a small force of sailors led by Lieutenant Robert Maynard. Teach was a shrewd and calculating leader who spurned the use of force, relying instead on his fearsome image to elicit the response that he desired from those whom he robbed. Contrary to the modern-day picture of the traditional tyrannical pirate, he commanded his vessels with the consent of their crews and there is no known account of his ever having harmed or murdered those whom he held captive. He was romanticized after his death and became the inspiration for an archetypal pirate in works of fiction across many genres. Early Life Little is known about Blackbeard's early life. It is commonly believed that at the time of his death he was between 35 and 40 years old, and thus born in about 1680. In contemporary records his name is most often given as Blackbeard, Edward Thatch or Edward Teach, the latter is most often used. Several spellings of his surname exist, Thatch, Thatch, Thake, Thack, Tack, Thatchy, and Thich. One early source claims that his surname was Drummond, but the lack of any supporting documentation makes this unlikely. Pirates habitually used fictitious surnames while engaged in piracy, so as not to tarnish the family name and this makes it unlikely that Teach's real name will ever be known. The 17th century rise of Britain's American colonies and the rapid 18th century expansion of the Atlantic slave trade had made Bristol an important international seaport, and Teach was most likely raised in what was then the second largest city in England. He could almost certainly read and write. He communicated with merchants and when killed had in his possession a letter addressed to him by the Chief Justice and Secretary of the Province of Carolina. Tobias Knight. The author Robert Lee speculated that Teach may therefore have been born into a respectable, wealthy family. He may have arrived in the Caribbean in the last years of the 17th century, on a merchant vessel. The 18th century author Charles Johnson claimed that Teach was for some time a sailor operating from Jamaica on privateer ships during the War of the Spanish Succession, and that he had often distinguished himself for his uncommon boldness and personal courage. At what point during the war Teach joined the fighting is, in keeping with the record of most of his life before he became a pirate, unknown. New Providence With its history of colonialism, trade and piracy, the West Indies was the setting for many 17th and 18th century maritime incidents. The privateer turned pirate Henry Jennings and his followers decided, early in the 18th century, to use the uninhabited island of New Providence as a base for their operations. It was within easy reach of the Florida Strait, and its busy shipping lanes, which were filled with European vessels crossing the Atlantic. New Providence's harbor could easily accommodate hundreds of ships, but was too shallow for the Royal Navy's larger vessels to navigate. The author George Woodbury described New Providence as, no city of homes. It was a place of temporary sojourn and refreshment, for a literally floating population, continuing, 
the only permanent residents were the piratical camp followers, the traders, and the hangers-on. All others were transient. In New Providence, pirates found a welcome respite from the law. Teach was one of those who came to enjoy the island's benefits. Probably shortly after the signing of the Treaty of Utrecht, he moved there from Jamaica, and, along with most privateers once involved in the war, became involved in piracy. Possibly about 1716, he joined the crew of Captain Benjamin Hornigold, a renowned pirate who operated from New Providence's safe waters. In 1716 Hornigold placed Teach in charge of a sloop he had taken as a prize. In early 1717, Hornigold and Teach, each captaining a sloop, set out for the mainland. They captured a boat carrying 120 barrels of flour out of Havana, and shortly thereafter took 100 barrels of wine from a sloop out of Bermuda. A few days later, they stopped a vessel sailing from Madeira to Charlestown, South Carolina. Teach and his quartermaster, William Howard, may at this time have struggled to control their crews. By then they had probably developed a taste for Madeira wine, and on the 29th of September near Cape Charles all they took from the Betty of Virginia was her cargo of Madeira, before they scuttled her with the remaining cargo. It was during this cruise with Hornigold that the earliest known report of Teach was made, in which he is recorded as a pirate in his own right, in command of a large crew. In a report made by a Captain Matthew Mienth on an anti-piracy patrol for North Carolina, Thatch was described as operating a sloop six guns and about seventy men. In September Teach and Hornigold encountered Steve Bonnet, a landowner and military officer from a wealthy family who had turned to piracy earlier that year. Bonnet's crew of about seventy were reportedly dissatisfied with his command, so with Bonnet's permission, Teach took control of his ship Revenge. The pirate's flotilla now consisted of three ships. Teach on Revenge, Teach sold sloop, and Hornigold's ranger. By October, another vessel had been captured and added to the small fleet. The sloops Robert of Philadelphia and Good Intent of Dublin were stopped on the 22nd of October 1717, and their cargo holds emptied. As a former British privateer, Hornigold attacked only his old enemies, but for his crew, the sight of British vessels filled with valuable cargo passing by unharmed became too much and at some point toward the end of 1717 he was demoted. Whether Teach had any involvement in this decision is unknown, but Hornigold quickly retired from piracy. He took Ranger and one of the sloops, leaving Teach with revenge and the remaining sloop. The two never met again, and with many other occupants of New Providence, Hornigold accepted the King's pardon from Woods Ridges in June the following year. Blackbeard on 28 November Teach's two ships attacked a French merchant vessel off the coast of St. Vincent. They each fired a broadside across its bulwarks, killing several of its crew, and forcing its captain to surrender. The ship was La Concorde of St. Malo, a large French Guinea man carrying a cargo of slaves. Teach and his crews sailed the vessel south along St. Vincent and the Grenadines to Bequia, where they disembarked her crew and cargo, and converted the ship for their own use. The crew of La Concorde were given the smaller of Teach's two sloops, which they renamed Mauvais Rencontre, and sailed for Martinique. Teach may have recruited some of their slaves, but the remainder were left on the island and were later recaptured by the returning crew of Mauvais Rencontre. Teach immediately renamed La Concorde as Queen Anne's Revenge and equipped her with 40 guns. By this time Teach had placed his Lieutenant Richards in command of Bonnet's Revenge. In late November, near St. Vincent, he attacked the Great Allen. After a lengthy engagement, he forced the large and well-armed merchant ship to surrender. He ordered her to move closer to the shore, disembarked her crew and emptied her cargo holds, and then burned and sank the vessel. The incident was chronicled in the Boston Newsletter, which called Teach the commander of a French ship of 32 guns, a brigantine of 10 guns, and a sloop of 12 guns. When or where Teach collected the 10-gun brigantine is unknown, but by that time he may have been in command of, at least 150 men split among three vessels. On 5 December 1717 Teach stopped the merchant sloop Margaret off the coast of Crab Island, near Anguilla. Her captain, Henry Bostock, and crew, remained Teach's prisoners for about eight hours, and were forced to watch as their sloop was ransacked. Bostock who had been held aboard Queen Anne's Revenge, was returned unharmed to Margaret and was allowed to leave with his crew. 
he returned to his base of operations on St. Christopher Island and reported the matter to Governor Walter Hamilton, who requested that he sign an affidavit about the encounter. Bostock's deposition details Teach's command of two vessels, a sloop, and a large French guinea man, Dutch built, with 36 cannon and a crew of 300 men. The captain believed that the larger ship carried valuable gold dust, silver plate, and, a very fine cup, supposedly taken, from the commander of Great Allen. Teach's crew had apparently informed Bostock that they had destroyed several other vessels, and that they intended to sail to Hispaniola and lie in wait for an expected Spanish armada, supposedly laden with money to pay the garrisons. Bostock also claimed that Teach had questioned him about the movements of local ships, but also that he had seemed unsurprised when Bostock told him of an expected royal pardon from London for all pirates. Bostock's deposition describes Teach as a tall, spare man, with a very black beard which he wore very long. It is the first recorded account of Teach's appearance and is the source of his cognomen, Blackbeard. Later descriptions mention that his thick black beard was braided into pigtails, sometimes tied in with small colored ribbons. Johnson described him as such a figure that imagination cannot form an idea of a fury from hell to look more frightful. Whether Johnson's description was entirely truthful or embellished is unclear, but it seems likely that Teach understood the value of appearances. Better to strike fear into the heart of one's enemies than rely on bluster alone. Teach was tall, with broad shoulders. He wore knee-length boots and dark clothing, topped with a wide hat and sometimes a long coat of brightly colored silk or velvet. Johnson also described Teach in times of battle as wearing a sling over his shoulders, with three brace of pistols, hanging in holsters like bandoliers, and stuck lighted matches under his hat, the latter apparently to emphasize the fearsome appearance he wished to present to his enemies. Despite his ferocious reputation though, there are no verified accounts of his ever having murdered or harmed those he held captive. Teach may have used other aliases. On 30 November, the Montserrat merchant encountered two ships and a sloop, commanded by a Captain Kentish and Captain Edwards. Enlargement of Teach's fleet Teach's movements between late 1717 and early 1718 are not known. He and Bonnet were probably responsible for an attack off St. Eustatius in December 1717. Henry Bostock claimed to have heard the pirates say they would head toward the Spanish-controlled Samana Bay in Hispaniola, but a cursory search revealed no pirate activity. Captain Hume have reported on 6 February that a pirate ship of 36 guns and 250 men and a sloop of 10 guns and 100 men were said to be cruising amongst the Leeward Islands. Hume reinforced his crew with musket-armed soldiers and joined up with to track the two ships, to no avail, though they discerned that the two ships had sunk a French vessel off St. Christopher Island, and reported also that they had last been seen gone down the north side of Hispaniola. Although no confirmation exists that these two ships were controlled by Teach and Bonnet, author Angus Constan believes it very likely they were. In March 1718, while taking on water at Turnif Island east of Burleys, both ships spotted the Jamaican logwood cutting sloop adventure making for the harbor. She was stopped and her captain, Harriet, invited to join the pirates. Harriet and his crew accepted the invitation, and Teach sent over a crew to sail adventure making Israel hands the captain. They sailed for the Bay of Honduras, where they added another ship and four sloops to their flotilla. On the 9th of April Teach's enlarged fleet of ships looted and burned Protestant Caesar. His fleet then sailed to Grand Cayman where they captured a small turtler. Teach probably sailed toward Havana, where he may have captured a small Spanish vessel that had left the Cuban port. They then sailed to the wrecks of the 1715 Spanish fleet, off the eastern coast of Florida. There Teach disembarked the crew of the captured Spanish sloop, before proceeding north to the port of Charlestown, South Carolina, attacking three vessels along the way. Blockade of Charlestown by May 1718, Teach had awarded himself the rank of Commodore and was at the height of his power. Late that month his flotilla blockaded the port of Charlestown in the province of South Carolina. All vessels entering or leaving the port were stopped, and as the town had no guard ship, its pilot boat was the first to be captured. Over the next five or six days about nine vessels were stopped and ransacked as they attempted to sail past Charlestown Bar, 
where Teach's fleet was anchored. One such ship, headed for London with a group of prominent Charlestown citizens which included Samuel Wragg, was the Crowley. Her passengers were questioned about the vessels still in port and then locked below decks for about half a day. Teach informed the prisoners that his fleet required medical supplies from the colonial government of South Carolina, and that if none were forthcoming, all prisoners would be executed, their heads sent to the governor and all captured ships burnt. Rag agreed to teach demands, and a Mr. Marx and two pirates were given two days to collect the drugs. Teach moved his fleet, and the captured ships, to within about five or six leagues from land. Three days later a messenger, sent by Marx, returned to the fleet. Marx's boat had capsized, and delayed their arrival in Charlestown. Teach granted a reprieve of two days, but still the party did not return. He then called a meeting of his fellow sailors and moved eight ships into the harbor, causing panic within the town. While Marx finally returned to the fleet, he explained what had happened. On his arrival he had presented the pirates' demands to the governor, and the drugs had been quickly gathered, but the two pirates sent to escort him had proved difficult to find. They had been busy drinking, with friends and were finally discovered, drunk. Teach kept to his side of the bargain and released the captured ships, and his prisoners, albeit relieved of their valuables, including the fine clothing some had worn. Beaufort Inlet Whilst at Charlestown, Teach learned that Woods Ridges had left England with several men of war, with orders to purge the West Indies of pirates. Teach's flotilla sailed northward along the Atlantic coast and into Tops Hill Inlet, off the coast of North Carolina. There they intended to careen their ships to scrape their hulls, but Queen Anne's revenge ran aground on a sandbar, cracking her main mast, and severely damaging many of her timbers. Teach ordered several sloops to throw ropes across the flagship in an attempt to free her. A sloop commanded by Israel Hands of Adventure also ran aground, and both vessels appeared to be damaged beyond repair, leaving only revenge, and the captured Spanish sloop. Teach had at some stage learnt of the offer of royal pardon and probably confided in Bonnet his willingness to accept it. The pardon was open to all pirates who surrendered on or before 5 September 1718 but contained a caveat stipulating that immunity was offered only against crimes committed before 5 January. Although in theory this left Bonnet and Teach at risk of being hanged for their actions at Charlestown Bar, most authorities could waive such conditions. Teach thought that Governor Charles Eden was a man he could trust, but to make sure, he waited to see what would happen to another captain. Bonnet left immediately on a small sailing boat for Bath Town, where he surrendered to Governor Eden, and received his pardon. He then travelled back to Beaufort Inlet to collect the revenge and the remainder of his crew, intending to sail to St. Thomas Island, to receive a commission. Unfortunately for him, Teach had stripped the vessel of its valuables and provisions, and had marooned its crew. Bonnet set out for revenge, but was unable to find him. He and his crew returned to piracy and were captured on 27 September 1718, at the mouth of the Cape Fear River. All but four were tried and hanged in Charlestown. The author Robert Lee surmised that Teach and Hans intentionally ran the ships aground to reduce the fleet's crew complement, increasing their share of the spoils. During the trial of Bonnet's crew, Revenge's boatswain Ignatius Pell testified that the ship was run ashore and lost, which Thatch, Teach, caused to be done. Lee considers it plausible that Teach let Bonnet in on his plan to accept a pardon from Governor Eden. He suggested that Bonnet do the same, and as war between the Quadruple Alliance of 1718 and Spain was threatening, to consider taking a privateer's commission from England. Lee suggests that Teach also offered Bonnet the return of his ship revenge. Constant proposes a similar idea, explaining that Teach began to see Queen Anne's revenge as something of a liability, while a pirate fleet was anchored. News of this was sent to neighboring towns and colonies, and any vessels nearby would delay sailing. It was prudent therefore for Teach not to linger for too long, although wrecking the ship was a somewhat extreme measure. Brought to you by Wikividi Documentaries Would you like to know more?